the concerns in the book are the concerns that I would I would suggest more or less everyone has right now. Uh, concerns that that call forth to our minds what it is that we have in common uh, about our relationship with this this moment in this world that we're living in. Uh, so we're concerned characteristically um, about change, about the idea of fate, about um, <clears throat> competition and conformity, and how it seems that the more we compete, the more we conform, and the more we conform, the more we need to compete. Uh, concerns about the power of money and how it can be that money is such an equalizing force in some ways, and yet creates uh, some of the sharpest, most visible inequalities in life. Uh, concerns about our relationship to mortality and fear, uh, fear surrounding death and the randomness of death, but also the, the slow creep of death, uh, the death that kind of makes itself at home and sits around sort of silently judging you while you waste your spare time flipping through Twitter and refreshing Facebook and yeah. all that sort of thing. Uh, concerns about uh, loneliness and uh, our inability to sit still, but also our, our loss of desire to sit still, uh, our feeling that the, the less we move, the worse off we are. Um, and then on the flip side of that, um, the shift that's underway between a kind of uh, vertical mobility, upward mobility view of success mm. uh, toward, toward something that's looking more a bit like, like a horizontal uh, mobility view of success, mm. uh, where many of the most despairing of voters uh, are, are now, I think, pretty much on record saying, you know, I'm I'm stuck here. I'm trapped physically where I am, mm. uh, which is which is out of sync with the American mythos, and I think out of sync with uh, some of our deepest sensibilities around around freedom and flourishing. Mm. So it's this big nugget of anxieties <clears throat> and fears um, all tending to point toward uh, a, a shared sensation that we're in the middle of some kind of great transition and we don't fully understand it and we have a, a sort of love-hate relationship with the parts of it that we do understand. Um, all that was was well underway when Tocqueville was writing Democracy in America. Mm. and Which is a very uh, interesting, let me interrupt you just to... Just to... Sure throw in that I think it's interesting that you take as a premise that all these phenomena you just described or sketched, which, uh, which I at least think most people think of as very contemporary phenomena, sociological phenomena, your premise is that this was all fully underway by Tocqueville's, uh, you know, appearance in America and his, um, you know, it, which makes some sense to me. I think that starting in the late 18th century, you see a lot of the the especially in the elite educated upper class you do see a lot of the at least the kernel of what we're dealing with now on a mass scale um so it makes sense to me but i'm fascinated that or i, I find it interesting that that's something that you are comfortable enough to just take for granted well that that's right and you know the the time scale is is interesting in its own right uh although these phenomena and these concerns these features of social life were fully present in Tocqueville's time uh, they were also quite new. Uh, and so on the one hand, he was interested in, in trying to furnish uh, European aristocrats who inclined in a liberal direction, trying to reassure them that they could learn something about how to craft a politics that works in a democratic age, and that looking to America was the best place to do that uh, because it was working there. Um, at the same time that he was he was embarked on that project, there was a deeper project, uh, which was simply to examine how uh, social conditions were changing in America um, in a way that couldn't necessarily be manipulated through politics. Mm. Uh, he was. Um, he was bent on illustrating sort of the limits of politics mm. and at the same time the great force of, uh, of what we might call democratization or globalization or modernization, mm. um, that whole sweep of forces, uh, which is not, um, according to Tocqueville, at root a uh, political phenomenon, mm. uh, and which in, in some cases politics can really only nibble around the edge of, mm -hmm. of that phenomenon. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, so you've got, you've got Tocqueville 
as a touchstone or uh, in some sense a lens through which to look at all this stuff. What what's the same today? What's changed? What are you know? What's the thrust of your book as regards America and the world in 2016 with Trump and Syria and uh, China and Putin and whatever else you think of as being really significant? You know, ethno nationalism across Europe, what have you? Um, how does it all connect? One thing that's that's quite similar uh, is that what what Tocqueville called the spread of the equality of conditions, um, which is uh, sameness in habits, sameness in mores, sameness in uh, desires. Uh, Peter Thiel calls this the convergence of desire, where you know what, whatever There's nice restaurant you you go into around the world, you will you will be served. Uh, you know the. Um, you will be served the cristal. You will be served the the caviar. It's like there's not a lot of variation at the top. Uh, and you know, in in a, a bygone age, uh, different um, aristocratic cultures would have oftentimes quite different standards of excellence, yeah. uh, standards of value. Uh, and that's you know that's melting away. So you can have you know, frankly, what's what's looking like a fourth Reich of sorts developing in China. Uh, with you know concentrated authoritarian rule and ethno nationalism and sort of purging or suppressing um, ethnic and political difference uh, <clears throat> combined with this great sort of corporate corporatist economy, still in China, uh, it, it, despite the fact that it is um, running a playbook so different from America's, from you know sort of a, a cultural DNA that's so different from ours, mm -hmm. there's still this tremendous similarity in sort of like what an awesome new building looks like and what a flourishing market looks like and what the appetites of people who have money look like. Like, all, you know, people want protein as they get more money. People want fast cars as they get more, like all those kinds of things. Yeah. Um, Tocqueville saw that happening um, in his time as well. And uh, he singled out um, Russia as an example of uh, a country that had, had, come into its own because of the unfolding of equality mm. in a way that the, that the U S did, but, but the Russians did it sort of through force mm. and the Americans did it through, through economic activity. Mm. Mm. Uh, and, and so there's kind of this, this pregnant question at the end of, uh, of one of the volumes of democracy in America, where Europe is, um, confused, lost sort of out of joint, with the times, uh, and yet you have the Americans and the Russians both surging forward on the basis of their, um, their different, uh, but in some ways strangely similar, uh, exploitation of equalization or democratization. Mm. Uh, not, not in that political sense that we're accustomed to now where it's like, well, you know, there's, there isn't a, you know, a secret, there isn't a secret ballot or there isn't freedom of the press. Yeah. And, you know, that's, that's not the sense in which Tocqueville was speaking of democracy, uh, although, of course, he was a big, a big partisan of liberty and, and of freedom. Uh, he said to the Americans, they like liberty, but they love equality, and if they have to pick one and not the other, it's going to be equality, because it's, it's hardwired into the fabric of everyday life. Uh, so that's, that's one similarity. One thing that's a bit different, or has accelerated more, uh, is just the sheer craziness of everyday life. Uh, there were there were some some manifestations of this back in the 1830s and 40s. You know, Tocqueville said that um, Americans keep going after their their rational minds stop sort of delivering goods for them. Uh, so that you know that hasn't changed much, uh, but just the sheer complexity of of the playing field today. Yeah. Um, when it comes to identity and um, affinity groups and work and play and sex and love and um, and the ideology of change and the ideology of speed that have have flourished so much in our time, um, people are, I think, now you know, with with less and less shame, crazier than ever. Uh, we seem to be more willing to admit that we live in crazy times and, you know, not in a, a sort of 
pejorative way um, where you're dismissing someone who's mentally ill as just crazy. crazy yeah. But um, but in that sort of that that gray area between um, coherent and structured and orderly on one end and and like clinically ill on the other, there's this big gray area in the middle where things are um, uh, chaotic and uh, and diverse in a shifting way, uh, but also very uniform in another way. Uh, where even even the most exaggerated of uh, of differences and uh, adopted identities um, still kind of get plowed into this this monoculture that we're living in, um, and that that fuels the craziness of everyday life as well. So although it was it was present in Tocqueville's time, it has definitely ramped up now. Uh, he would be shocked by how much it has ramped up. Uh, but, you know, given a few days, he would probably be able to quickly process that reality. Hmm. Um, I want to try to bring Reef in. I'm not sure if we've got enough on the table yet to do it, but let me ask, to what extent does Reef's um, basic uh, conceptual uh, vision of sort of a uh, a, a symbolic, a culture being a symbolic system in which you have these moral interdicts, uh, counterbalanced, but not, not in balance, like a, with an unequal tension between a system of moral interdictions and, and the sort of remissive uh, uh, impulse on the other side, or the, you know, the, what would you call it, rebellious impulse or free, unfettered impulse on the other side, and the sort of therapeutic uh, mode in which our culture has been trying to work itself out or, or decide what it is over the past between one and 200 years. How much does that have to do with the differences between our time and Tocqueville's time? Um, uh, yeah, I just want to sort of add that to the mix here. If you could, if you could, uh, and, and, and see what you have to say about it. Sure. I mean, there, there are a couple of ways to cut into this. I think it's, it's useful to, consider what's going on with, uh, with the contrast between Tocqueville, who was not a reactionary. Uh, he was, he was a, an aristocratic liberal um, <clears throat> and a social theorist. Uh, and, and Reef, who, who was indeed a reactionary um, and, and a social theorist, uh, but of course much, much later in the game than, than Tocqueville. Um, for those kind of trad cons or you know re reactionary paleos mm. out there mm. um reef is one of these figures like christopher lash or alistair mm. mcintyre who comes along after you know tocqueville's illusions have been destroyed basically in their in their estimation uh you know helen riddlemeyer um who i've known now for for a number of years uh took this approach uh reviewing the book in uh, first things and mm. She said, look, all the things Tocqueville loved about America are dead. Um, I, you know, I don't think that's right. Um, but I understand how someone who, you know, spends too much time pining for a past that is irrecoverable could feel that way. Mm -hmm. uh, Tocqueville had no illusions about re-enchantment movements, mm. uh, you know, putatively of the right or of the left. Mm. Um, <clears throat> he was certainly against uh, disenchantment movements. Mm. Uh, he goes out of his way to ridicule the materialists, uh, sort of secular atheist uh, rationalists. Mm -hmm. uh, in democracy in America, uh, you know, less for their... Um, not just for their, their views, although he found their views to be um, willfully ignorant of demonstrably human nature, mm. uh, but also of where those views led them on, on that question of how much um, society can be manipulated through politics. Mm. Um, so he was, he was no fan of, of disenchantment. Mm -hmm. uh, but he was himself disenchanted in certain ways. You know, he was a lapsed, he was a lapsed Catholic. He, um, he said that he wrote democracy in America animated by something like a, a religious dread. Mm 
mm. uh, seeing this, this vast force of equality sort of just gobble up everything in its path. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, uh, uh, Karl Marx said sort of the same thing when he looked at this uh, great spectacle of international commerce Mm-hmm. Uh, and said, you know, all that is solid melts into air. Commodification. Um, yeah. That's right. There, and so, you know, and, and, and Marx was nearly a contemporary of Tocqueville's. Mm. Uh, Tocqueville died very young. Um, mm-hmm. But Tocqueville was alive, was alive for 1848. He was, he, was, um, he was in Paris during the 1848 revolution, wrote, wrote another book on that, which is, which is also worth people's time. Mm. Uh, but Tocqueville, um, just to get back to the original point, was held out no hope for for Americans who wanted to find shelter from the craziness of everyday life in some kind of hermetically sealed um, affinity group mm. uh, th- that hoped to somehow resurrect the uh, the old hierarchies yeah. um, that had that had passed away mm-hmm. uh, notably Tocqueville still, was was quite sure that religion would would do just fine. Uh, he thought there would be more atheists, but he thought there would be you know more Christians too. Mm. Um, other you know other other faiths we can we can get into if you want to talk about that. There's some more sort of nettles mm. and traps mm. o- over there. Uh, but the long and short of it is, you know, if if you're a reactionary conservative today, you're probably fairly devout, unless you are kind of one of these new alt-right people who are their own sort of evolving category. Uh, And if you are under the sway of of guys like McIntyre and and Lash and Reef, you are probably going to be skeptical of Tocqueville's view of the world. Mm -hmm. Uh, Nevertheless, um, whose view of the world has has sort of prevailed over time, I think, you know, I think Reef, t- to single him out, uh, was quite certainly a genius, and he did understand what, what therapeutic culture was and where it came from and why it persists. Mm. Uh, but he, um, he never really offered a way forward for people mm. other, other than sort of mortification. Mm. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> and and a level of discipline that you can really only acquire in the sort of university that itself does not quite exist anymore. Yeah. Uh, and I think realizing that that the university, which was the last bastion of of culture properly understood mm-hmm. for Reef. Mm-hmm. Uh, his recognition that 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 you know that the last table leg was being kicked away mm. uh, sent him into um, a sort of self-imposed exile mm. for for a, for a few for decades. Decades, as, my, as I understand it, I haven't read um, D- Death Works. I forget what the other book is called that he wrote shortly before he passed away. But it sounds I'm uh, the, eager to read it now. There are, there are a couple volumes: "My Life Among the Death Works" and uh, "The Crisis of the Officer Class," okay. uh, both of which um, are referenced in my book. Okay. Um, Reef was right about many things, um, but he did not put a, a great stock in freedom mm. um, for for a couple reasons, uh, and I think. The solution for people in the old world is going to look different than the solution for people in the new world, hmm. specifically in in the U.S. Hmm. Let me, uh, let, me uh, uh, let me interrupt yeah. and put a different uh, put a put or add a spin. I hope it's not I hope it's not uh, uh, too discontinuous with what we've just been talking about because I really wanted to get a lot of these ideas out there so that anyone who watches this will have a sense of where you're coming from. Um, sure. But I imagine that if anyone does watch it, um, at least anyone who watches it because I recommend it, they're going to be more on the left end of the spectrum politically to, to flatten things and simplify things. Um, sure. They're going to be more on the left end of the spectrum. Um, I, I personally, and I'm not sure how much this matters because all I really want to be here is an interlocutor, um, but I personally am some strange uh, blend or amalgam of 
far left views and I wouldn't say far right views, but definitely reactionary in a more, you know, to, from a 30,000 foot view, that word reactionary applies pretty cleanly to certain things that I tend to think about. Moral culture in particular. Um, uh, uh, but I don't want to let it, for the rest of the conversation, I don't want to let it be taken for granted that the reactionary view is, um, what am I trying to say? I think among, le among people on the left, it is a question why you would even take it seriously. Why would I read someone like Lash? Why would I read someone like Reef? Why would I read After Virtue or anything by McIntyre or indeed care about Tocqueville? Um, for someone who's basically, whose milieu today is basically, you know, identity politics and or, um, and or a sort of, you know, post-Marxist, but basically Marxist view of economic exploitation and injustice and whose ambitions for, uh, for our state and society can be expressed mostly in terms of um, economic equality uh, and redistribution. What's the, what's the thing that those people are missing that this conservative intellectual raft brings into the conversation? Are they, compa are they commensurable? Are they compatible? Are they addressing different concerns? Or indeed, it does an appreciation of Lash, Reef, Tocqueville, etc. conflict with all the intuitions that your sort of typical, prototypical left winger today is bringing to the table? I think it's a lot more of a complicated and, and fruitful rabbit hole to go down than people are, are aware. Uh, McIntyre was... Uh, and, and perhaps still is a Marxist. Um, Tocqueville wanted hard caps on how rich you could become. Uh, not because it's bad to be rich, mm. uh, but because in an age like ours, um, envy is natural given how similar everyone is. Hmm. And when everyone's driven into this sort of competitive conformity and the only people who can really punch through hmm. are people with extraordinarily um, powerful ambition and talent, hmm. uh, that breeds despair and frustration in hmm. a new sort of way. Hmm. Uh, when the aristocratic hierarchies fall away, there's this great surge of optimism mm. anything's possible uh we're all sort of like heroes mm. um the sky's the limit the frontiers open all of that sort of talk mm -hmm. tocqueville says as time wears on though people begin to realize that invisible barriers have sprung up where the old visible ones used to be mm. so suddenly everyone has a life coach and suddenly everyone is trying to get into the best preschool and mm -hmm. suddenly everyone has a worthless bachelor's degree and mm -hmm. suddenly everyone wants to work for the same 10 companies and they can't. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, there's this sort of trickle down of despair uh, where what seemed like it would be this great moment of liberation turns into almost like a, a cruel joke. Mm. Uh, and faced with that, um, the temptation is... Uh, is is to either fold ever further inward mm. or to lash out mm. briefly until exhausted mm. or, to, or to sort of swing back and forth between those two modes of existence. Mm. Uh, and, you know, and, and Tocqueville was not afraid to say, look, just as a matter of policy, um, people should have like a big, a big playground with high fences, basically. Um, lots mm. of room for human ingenuity and enterprise to roam. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> but if you don't set those hard caps, um, your society is going to be animated by a kind of, of hatred and disgust that is going to be very difficult for policy to address. Mm. Uh, he, says, he says, you know, the, the wealthy could bankrupt themselves trying to basically bribe people not to hate them. Mm. Um, 
but it is it is their pride that is wanted more than their money. Yeah. Uh, to most people on the left, that'll be like, well, no, give the poor people the money. Like, that's mm-hmm. just, it's that simple. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, it, you know, we can sort of argue with our wonk hats on about just how much of a safety net there should be. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's a, you know, that's a policy conversation. Uh, but Tocqueville's speaking to to something deeper uh, than than optimizing the distribution of resources, uh, and you know he's a social theorist. He's not an economist, and he would he would definitely reject the idea that that economics is the master science. Uh, so there's more than meets the eye to uh, to Tocqueville. He's not just this creature of the right. Mm-hmm. Um, you know there was there was kind of the the Robert Putnam era Tocqueville where it's like. Oh, people are lonely. We should be having more hot tub parties, and then society will be better. And you know, maybe uh, there's that previous sort of Cold War Tocqueville, where it was like, you know, we need to have more Elks Club meetings, or else mm-hmm. we're going to turn into the Soviet Union. Uh, yeah, maybe you know. Um, and so Tocqueville has been kind of the the property of different strains of intellectual thought over the years, and they have tended toward uh, toward what seems like the conventional right. Um, but there's more. There's more going on there, and folks on the left should should consider it. But they should do so, especially I think, uh, now that they're at this kind of identity crisis moment of their own, mm. uh, where where guys like Lash were warning in the '80s and '90s mm-hmm. uh, that if you if you try to find salvation in these Hall of Mirrors identity games, you will not, and you will furthermore lose elections. I mean, mm. Lash was quite quite clear about this and he was he was proved right Mm. um uh given that reappraisal that's that's taking place right now on the left um i think it would behoove people to um to read my book now to uh (laughs) to take to take a serious look at um at the social theory that's going on um and has been going on now for for centuries uh, that calls into fundamental question uh, whether you know there there's any hope of of finding refuge or 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 durable political power in these kind of reenchantment movements. Uh, Tocqueville's answer was no. Um, although the reactionaries, um, the more modern reactionaries, you know, sometimes say yes. Um, it's even complicated for them too. Uh, you know, a guy like Rod Dreher, who is all about the, the quote unquote Benedict option of mm-hmm. basically withdrawing from society into mm-hmm. your small community. Uh, that's straight out of McIntyre. And of course, Rod is reviled on the left for being basically a, a bigoted Christian. Mm-hmm. Um, if that sort of stuff bothers you as someone on the left, uh, Tocqueville is not going to bother you. Uh, he is not this sort of dogmatic uh, doctrinal Christian of mm. the of the of the left's you know fear and loathing. Mm. Um, he's he's uh, he's a lapsed Catholic who thinks that the the minimum kind of religion that holds a society together well is one that causes people to uh, think of the future as a real thing in their lives, mm. um, usually because of the immortality of the soul. Mm. Uh, basically for Tocqueville, uh, you know, the minimal religion for the purposes of, of a healthy society is some understanding of, of immortality and the equality of people of, you know, of, of the immortal soul, Hmm. um, which is, you know, there's, there's a lot, I I guess, packed into the answer, but that's by, by way of, of trying to sketch out some of the important, uh, features of, of Tocqueville's thought. Yeah. specifically, yeah. Um, that make it worth worth the average liberal's while. So coming back to what you said about Tocqueville's prediction that alongside an increase in secularism, or I'm not sure how you would, how you would uh, define that exactly, an increase in the number of thoroughly secular people or an increase in the general secularism of people who remain nominally or in some sense religious or... That alongside that, you would have this increase in Christianity or Christianness, um, again, maybe by maybe in terms of extension throughout the society, maybe in terms of intensity within individual lives. Um, this religious dimension, I'm probably getting it wrong, you can correct me, this religious dimension of Tocqueville's vision for 
where things can go, where things are going. How does that connect? And, and I want to keep us on the terrain of, you know, at least being conscious of the point of view of a contemporary leftist. How does that connect with our concerns today? I, as a Christian, think it would mean one set of things for me that it might not mean for a person in whose life religion is not playing at least a major role. Um, but I really want to try to speak to people in whose lives religion is not playing a major role right now. Um, not in a way that ignores religion, you know, or tries to strip it out of Tocqueville, but like, to the extent, is there a way to connect what he thinks insofar as it has to do with religion with the life and thought of a person today who is a largely secular person? Sure. Can you, can uh, you connect those things? Oh, yeah. So uh, just going back to the point that Tocqueville was a lapsed Catholic, hmm. um, that didn't mean that he was uh, a secularist, and it didn't mean that he was an atheist, uh, but it did mean that he was partly partly disenchanted, yet still retained Catholic patterns of thought. Um, so what he took from Catholicism was the insight that uh, if your society lacks sort of intermediaries between the many at the bottom and the, the one at the top, um, you're, the risks of um, the risks of, of collective misery, are going to change in a certain way. Uh, so, you know, we're all familiar, especially folks on the left, with the way that um, that very traditionalistic and hierarchy-bound Catholic civilization can uh, keep people locked in material misery at the bottom. Yeah. Um, however, uh, on the other side, Tocqueville says, look... Um, if Protestants lose their faith, they they fall all the way to the bottom of the pile because there are no intermediaries in their life. Um, in in the same way that uh, Protestant Christianity supposes uh, that it's you know that religion is between me and Jesus basically, mm -hmm. and no no one needs to get in the way of that relationship, and and, and perhaps no one should. Mm -hmm. Uh, like a priest or even a saint, you know, to, to say nothing of so sort of the, the lower functionaries of, you know, Catholic hierarchy. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> that model, uh, Tocqueville suggests, is, is replicated throughout seemingly secular parts of life in Protestant and post-Protestant civilization. Mm. Uh, and when Protestants become disenchanted, uh, they find themselves utterly alone dwarfed by this one massive thing off in the distance somewhere, be it, you know, society mm -hmm. or the experts or mm -hmm. the state. Mm -hmm. uh, and they find it very difficult to organize around intermediary institutions. Um, and that primes them for a kind of despair that you don't get even among very miserable uh, aristocratic pre-modern Catholic societies. Hmm. Uh, where it seems like people just have this appetite for drudgery mm -hmm. uh, and obscurity that would never exist in a Protestant or post-Protestant society. The appetite would never exist. That's right. Yeah. Uh, so, so for, for folks on the left um, who are inclined to think that secularization is generally good, um, Tocqueville offers some consolations, but then offers some sharp challenges as well. Uh, because he is, you know, he is very, very soft on religion in a way that you wouldn't expect from him. Uh, but he's also very hard on, um, you know, just as a matter of, of social theory, you know, not personal judgment. Um, but he wants us to understand that the costs of secularization in a, in a post-Protestant society can be uh, very profound. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that, again, you know, no matter how clever your experts are in your policy shop, uh, there is not a lot that they can do to arrest and reverse that long fall into despair mm -hmm. among ex-Protestants. Other than other than throw money at them, yeah. you know that's yeah. that's always a tool in the toolkit. But again, 
uh, when when what's going on at the, the at a human nature level is psychological, sociological stuff concerning despair and envy and fear of mortality and anxiety about fate and chance. Mm. Sure, you know, at the margins, having five hundred five thousand bucks in the bank is going to keep some of that stuff at bay. Yeah, um, but that's you can't sort of right the ship of society just by keeping that money flowing. Even if we all decide at the end of the day that like, you know what, on balance, sure, let's just run permanent large deficits. You know, I mean, does anyone really think, really think that we can have justice without just kind of maintaining this gigantic tab forever? Yeah. Probably, probably not many people, mm-hmm. really, yeah. when you really sort of pin them down. Yeah. Uh, you know, Tocqueville's not out to challenge that. Um, he's not out to say, like, no, we need a balanced budget. He's not that guy. Mm-hmm. But he is the guy who says, like, you know, even if this is fine from a policy standpoint, you might still live in a, a, a deeply, profoundly unhappy and lost and confused and, and self-wounding society. Mm. So what's the prescription? Um, and I think maybe there's aspects of it that have been implicit in what you've been saying already, but if you could spell it out, um, sort of put a fine point on it. What is, what did Tocqueville say in his own time and, and what's your, uh, what's, what's your way forward? Or is there a, is there a sort of clear way forward? Or, Cause I haven't read your book, so I don't know to what extent it's just a meditation on these questions or, and to what extent you've got a prescription. Uh, so I think the prescription has, you know, maybe three parts to it. One is, uh, it's okay for all of us to relax a little bit about policy. Um, I think probably, uh, the, the ideological warfare on the policy side is, um, about to be exhausted. Um, you know, we'll see what happens with Trump, but I do think there is the makings of a, a new sort of policy consensus out there, which is, um, continue to spend money that we don't have, um, and uh, do it in a way that that keeps um, that keeps the the nation um, from sort of disintegrating mm. cognitively in mm. people's minds. Mm. Uh, you know, the only thing worse than having this distant meddlesome government looming over you is to then watch that too sort of disintegrate you know along with along with everything else yeah. uh that nobody that's it's taken us down a bad road yeah. um so in one sense c- coming out of tocqueville i'm i'm more cavalier than ever about the right policy mm-hmm. um and i'm more sort of forgiving than ever about um about the the clumsy excesses of government um, you know, politics is sort of this third-rate enterprise in America, and it's it's not. We're just not going to have the level of of, of virtuoso statecraft uh, that you would have in you know in sort of like ancient Sparta. I mean, it's sure, it's yeah. just not happening. Yeah. Uh, so I think we need to be forgiving of our of our uh, clumsy and overbaked policy. Mm. Um, and that, you know, that means being a little more forgiving of, of the ignoramuses as well as like the experts, you know, they both make a mess of things. And so long as we can have that attitude of forbearance going into just muddling through, I think it'll help us to muddle through. Hmm. Uh, and perhaps muddling through is, is the best we can do. And a new consensus around policy might emerge in, in the spirit of muddling through. Hmm. Uh, this is a transitional time. It's going to be difficult. Uh, we should not be shooting for perfection. Um, and we should be, consider ourselves fortunate just to like, to live, to see another day as, as the number one sort of place in the world to be. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay. So that's, that's one chunk of it. Um, another chunk of it is, uh, friendship. Mm. Um, this is, this is one remaining way where people can, pull themselves out of themselves and let go of the mania surrounding selfhood. Mm. Um, people are trying to, you know, even the folks who aren't falling back on identity politics, they still want to have this sort of obsession with identity much of the time mm. where it's like, okay, well, if I'm not, you know, if I'm not this bumper sticker, if I'm not, you know, 
just one of these people who look like me and dress like me and talk like me, listen to the same, you know, yeah. then, then, then I am the world. Yeah. To quote from, you know, uh, from, from Wagner's Siegfried, you know, there's that sort of that angry, like, but me, but me, you know, um, that, well, there is the more that people sort of dive, it double down on that feeling. Uh, I think the more they discover that there is no there, there, the mm -hmm. self is a construct. And that doesn't mean that you and I aren't sort of physically mm -hmm. present beings. Of course we are. Mm -hmm. Um, but, but the deeper you look into selfhood and this is, you know, this is straight out of Hamlet. This is not new news, yeah. right? This yeah. is the deeper you dive into selfhood, the more you will sort of be lost in the labyrinth. Um, yeah. selfhood is, is not a sanctuary. It's a labyrinth. And, the way to, to get out of that frame at a time when institutions are losing public trust and people are more delinked than ever and disembodied uh, and discarnate, to use uh, Marshall McLuhan's term, mm -hmm. um, and yet there is still friendship. Mm. Even for the most sort of spasmodic and depressed and confused and bitter, you know, and, and we've all cycled through these emotions, you know, I'm not singling out some group of neurotics where this is all of us now mm -hmm. in, in certain way. Mm -hmm. Um, there, there is still friendship, uh, and, and real friendship too, not just like the kind of friendship you have with the, the person you sort of low key stock on Instagram or, you know, the, the person who you insist on turning into your BFF and then have this weird psychodrama with that, like the, the like actual legitimate friendship is still possible in this world and and the art of being free is in large measure the art of being friends mm. rightly under, rightly understood mm. uh so that's that's chunk two and then just to round things off you know there there is a I'm going to use this phrase there's a self-care aspect here mm. right okay. um and, and part of it is letting go of that idea of the self you know and not to get too Christian mystic on everyone, mm -hmm. or, or too Californian, as I'm sometimes accused of being by my by my East Coast friends. Um, but you you have to be able to forgive yourself for the the briefness briefness of your life mm -hmm. and the limitations of your perspective and the things that you've inherited from the past that bedevil you and the relationships that you uh, were born into that you can't choose. Mm -hmm. Like there is baggage mm -hmm. and you have it. And it's oftentimes more real than the self that you try to pry away from that baggage. You mm -hmm. have to forgive yourself for that. Mm -hmm. um, all the forgiveness in the world from, you know, your favorite celebrities who say that they love all their fans or from the government, which, you know, sort of writes off your debt or gives you a tax credit or all the forgiveness from God in the world um, is is going to not be enough for you if you can't forgive yourself. Mm -hmm. um, and there's there's a way in which that moment of forgiveness destroys some pride, mm -hmm. but it also creates the possibility of a, a different kind of pride. And pride might not even be the right word for it, but I think it's what what people are, are longing for, uh, you know, not the kind of pride that you get from a parade or from a participation trophy or from, you know, like giving someone the sickest burn of all time on Twitter. Like mm -hmm. that, that's a, that is a, a thing that exists, that kind of pride. Mm -hmm. Um, and we we'll, we can't expect it to, to vanish. You know, I'm not here selling heaven on earth, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, but, I think if we do focus on that kind of personal inventory where it's like, what is the payoff from this pattern of activity? Like, what is this doing for me? And is it, is it reality based, you know, or is it about, is it about, you know, trying to hurt the pain yeah, yeah. as some form of revenge, you know, against myself for this, all the things I hate about myself. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's something we all need to kind of face up to and accept and forgive and move away from. Uh, and if we do that and we become more forgiving on the policy front, not sloppy, not unprincipled, just more forgiving. Um, and then rediscover the art of friendship. Uh, I think that there's, there's not a very good case for despair after all, if mm. we do those things. Mm. Mm. The, um, the, the, at least, at least the first two things. Well, no, I guess basically everything you just said 
to the extent that it involves a chain, like you want to shift the axis on which our relationship with ourself uh, turns so that it's so that we, we move away from this sort of obsession with what is my identity? How have I been wronged? What did I expect of myself and how did I let myself down? Um, uh, you know, what are the details of what are the right ways to design a policy such that it's, you know, justly addresses all the people in a polity or what have you. I feel like there's an element that's, that's common through all, all three of your chunks that basically has to do with letting go of an obsession with who am I? And I think that the tension there, as I understand it is, or the problem with that, or what's difficult about that is, you know, we do have a society, like we do have, in, yes, we have the intuition that friendship is powerful and important. And yes, we have the intuition that self-forgiveness could be powerful, should be powerful. If you're a person who's managed to attain any degree of it, then probably you know it is powerful. Um, yes, we have the intuition that um, maybe, uh, maybe, you know, a particular policy question isn't the hill you want to die on as a, as a person who's trying to think productively about life. Um, but, but our answer is like, we also have the intuition that the details of policy do matter, you know, um, to the, to the family who's a beneficiary of some, uh, you know, redistributive or social welfare program or people who are on the Obamacare rolls or what, you know, whatever you think is a beneficial policy, the de details of that policy do matter in a, in a country of 300 million plus people. They do matter to a, a, a large number of people actually. And, um, you know, my, my identity, we can all see how it's possible to get pathologically preoccupied with the details of your own identity, but, you know, and we want to look past that. We want to transcend that and focus on things like friendship, uh, being open to things beyond ourselves, being other, you know, focus on other people instead of ourselves. But my identity does matter at the end of the day. If I don't, if I don't know to some, if there's not some kind of adequacy, which different people would define different ways, but if there's not some adequacy in my understanding of myself, I'm not going to be a good friend. I'm not really capable of friendship. And on the, and on the self-forgiveness front, if I'm a person who, um, uh, had potential that I'm not fulfilling or did bad things that I can't, uh, you know, made choices that I knew were wrong and I can't let go of them. Um, or, uh, you know, for, it crushes my ego when I see the Instagram, the people I follow on Instagram and, and I don't compare to them or, um, yes, we want to be able to get past all those things, but at the same time, I need to hold myself to standards and that's what drives me. And so with all that, with all those sort of remarks made, where do we, where should we draw our understanding from? Where should we draw our proper understanding, our healthy understanding of the self of the importance of justice and equality as regards, you know, political questions, policy questions. Um, where should we draw our understanding, from where should we draw our understanding of the self as regards, um, you know, the person I am as I step out into friendship or make myself available for friendship and invite friendship. Um, and as regards, you know, the, the potential that I have in the life I'm supposed to live and my obligations to myself. What, what is the basis on which we should be trying to construct and maintain and care for ourselves? Oh, I mean, I think that's a, a fine question, and I will do my best to answer it, even though that's sort of not what I'm selling. Okay. Right. Uh, you know, I was, I was, I told uh, Larry King um, in an interview that should go up uh, first week of January. I said, look, this is, you know, this isn't a book about how to be happy or how to be rich or how to be correct or how to, you know, it's a book about how to be free. Um, and freedom, I think, just as a, a sort of factual matter, is, is necessary to recognizably human flourishing. Um, but it's not sufficient. Um, and it doesn't exist in a vacuum. Uh, and in, in virtue of the reality of freedom, you're, 
you're not going to wind up with a society of people who all answer the questions you've just posed in the same way. Hmm. Uh, you're just you, to expect that sort of outcome in a free society is, I think, to to place a burden on people that they they're they're not going to bear. Uh, they're just they're not going to deliver for you on your expectation if that's the expectation you have of them in a free society. Uh, nevertheless, right? We can we can make some provisional judgments uh, based on what Tocqueville has to say. Um, so he has some remarks about Islam. Um, mm. One of the things that he says about Islam is, you know, look, the Puritans came to America and their um, conceptual apparatus, theologically, comported very well with their political thought hmm. to, an, to a degree that they were almost the same. Mm -hmm. um, whereas, he suggested, uh, and I think this is more or less borne out over the, the course of modern history, um, Islam characteristically proposes to intervene more forcefully and in greater detail in the fabric of everyday life mm. than Christianity. Mm. Uh, I know this will strike some people today as, as th that couldn't possibly be right. I mean, it's those Christians out there who want to make sure that every school teaches that the earth is 4,000 years old, and it's mm. those Christians who want the government to ban abortion. You know, like, mm -hmm. I get it. Right. Mm -hmm. Historically, that strain of Christianity is an aberration yeah. from the, the Christian norm. Yeah. To, be, to be sure, historically, societies were so fully Christian already that those kind of issues just didn't come up. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so I, it, it, this is one of those cases where you, where you do need to hear both sides. But I think Tocqueville's point stands that religions which wish to impose specific laws that interfere with the conduct of everyday life mm. will have a harder and harder time as the democratic age unfolds. Uh, I think Tocqueville would not be surprised that the moral majority fizzled. Mm. You know, that a lot of those moral majority guys ended up saying, eh, we lost the culture wars. Because funneling religious energy into specific policy prescriptions will not, just won't really work in a democratic age. Yeah. Uh, he said this of the Puritans. He said they came to America and they tried to wire the Old Testament law into the state law. Yeah. And, and, it, and not for long because it just didn't work. Yeah. Uh, what works is to have religion that sets down you know, sort of like the tax code. I mean, the patterns in Tocqueville's thinking reappear wherever you look for them. Um, a big area in which to play with tall fences. Hmm. Um, some key precepts uh, that, are, that are flexible enough to anchor people in their spiritual lives and psychological lives, but still give them the freedom to range widely over things like science and commerce and education and uh, governance and you, the whole field of human endeavor is opened up to experimentation and to um, you know competition but competition with a with a diversified flavor to it mm. uh, and for Tocqueville the genius of Christianity as it unfolded in the new world was that it simultaneously anchored people in their consciousness of how to be uh, but did so in a general enough way that the field of human endeavor was was still open and free. Mm -hmm. So I think in conclusion, you know, if if your religion tends to discourage that sort of activity, it will struggle in a democratic age. Mm -hmm. If it tends to encourage that sort of activity, it will flourish. Uh, and I think, you know, for all of the, the, the failings of the mainline Protestant churches today, uh, and you can just look at attendance records, and that's you know that's as good a metric as any. Mm. Um, the the American Mormons and the American Mexicans um, 
Catholics and, and LDS uh, are not terribly pessimistic people right now. Mm-hmm. Um, despite their, their different backgrounds and the different ways in which they have struggled with oppression in the past, uh, they are kind of on an upswing. Mm. Um, and, and although uh, Tocqueville certainly would not have expected, you know, uh, a homegrown American religion to become fantastically popular, mm. uh, I think he would um, not be surprised to see that um, that theological offerings that ground people while still giving them a wide field of endeavor are, are still quite popular and indeed more so over time. Mm -hmm. Well, I look forward to reading the book. Um, I think this is all super interesting, even if I'm asking questions that are a little bit, you know, biting off more than one book can chew maybe, or at least this book specifically wasn't designed to address them. Um, But you raise very interesting questions that even if they don't have political answers, um, you know, to me at any rate are the, are the sort of defining questions of our time. How do we take conversations about social justice, racial justice, the kinds of concerns that people on the left tend to prioritize today, and in some sense map those to or find a congruence between those and um, the ideas of, you know, the in some sense reactionary ideas that you're talking about. Um, uh, because I, I do think that people are talking past each other in a lot of the political debates right now. And, um, so this sounds like an interesting contribution. I look forward to reading the book and we're coming up on an hour here. So I think we should probably, um, wrap it up. I appreciate you taking the time to talk with me. Well, it's definitely my pleasure. And I, you know, thank you for, it's rare that I can talk about Reef and Tocqueville on the same day. Uh, so that's always great. And, you know, just as a closing thought, the conceit of the book is that, uh, in order to answer these nettlesome political questions uh, to our satisfaction and in a way that actually works for, for us as Americans, uh, we need to take a step back and, uh, and answer some of the questions that come before that we are anxious about facing up to. Uh, and that if we do, uh, then we can proceed to ask, you know, what kind of relationship with government would I like to have? Uh, and then we're on a, you know, then we're on a, a sort of different, different planet, different conversational planet. And I think one that's going to prove uh, more fruitful than the one we're on right now. Awesome. Well, cool, James. Thank you very much again. And uh, hopefully we can have another conversation at some point in the future. Anytime. Thanks, Christian. All right.